Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Calvary United Methodist Church and just a, a couple of announcements first in, in light of the, the recent uptick in, um, in uh, COVID activity. Uh, just want you to, to um, once again review the, the procedures and the, uh, the policies that we've put in place here at Calvary, but also that the CDC and um, uh, um, uh, the, the guidelines that have come down from CDC. Just want to make sure that we're in check with that. And if anybody um, gets sick, please, uh, um, you know, get tested and, and, and um, continue to, 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 to get to the doctor and, and figure that out. Um, let us know and then we'll see if there's a, a way that we can also be helpful. But but just keep that in mind. Uh, I also want to uh, point out just a couple of announcements. Um, uh, today, um, we're not going to uh, be continuing with uh, um, Sunday school. We're not going to start that up today. We're not going to have fellowship today. Um, and, and also not going to be doing communion here in the sanctuary in, in light of of the uptick in, in COVID as well. Um, however, the, the crop walk will continue to happen. Um, if you um, have any questions about that, feel free to, to ask Brenda, but, but she's asking that I convey this message. I'm gonna be meeting at Oxbow Park at two o'clock. Um, please know that you can walk at your own pace. You don't have to walk with the group. Walk as far as you want to, and there's no need to, to, to gather with your sponsors. Um, I want you also know that the, all of the proceeds go to, to feed the hungry, and you can see um, in the uh, bulletin uh, um, what, what you know what uh, the organization, and then also find out a little bit more about that. Um, and that um, that um, um, goes to to, to uh, local uh, feed the hungry, but also also around the world. And so so would encourage you to put your donations in the boxes in the back of the sanctuary. Um, also, she wants you to know that there's an admission charge to, to drive into the park. So if you're going to join with that, just be aware of that. Um, today is also a communion Sunday, and I have also said that we're not going to have that. But, but if God has put it up on your heart, there's also Feed the Hungry bulletins in, inside there. And you can um, put those in the offering plates at the back as well. So why don't we join together as, as we sing, um, stand and sing, uh, Guide Me, Great the, the, Thou Great Jehovah. Promises that they're not there, but the 
God, we come before you and we recognize the verses of these songs. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. 
And it's by your loving hand, your loving heart, your loving actions, and just your loving nature that comes to us and heals those hurts. Internal Father, we lay those, those hurts down at your feet. We ask that you allow us to feel your presence as you start to, to come amongst us, to walk amongst us, to take, as, as the, the mask said that I saw this morning, take that faith and instill it into us so that fear can't rule our lives. And so, Father, we ask that you give us comfort, give us direction, give us guidance, fill us with your peace as you release our anxiety and stress of the week, of the month, of the year. We ask that you take out your healing hand and you place it upon the sick that are with us this morning, the sick that are not necessarily with us, but most certainly upon our hearts and our minds, our thoughts. Allow them to feel your comforting hand, your healing hand both the physically sick and also those who are spiritually sick, we ask that you allow them to feel your presence through your grace, that they too may be justified in your Son Jesus Christ's name. Fill us with your provenient grace as you seek to take us from one step to the next and allow us to walk this journey alongside you. Just as Jesus did with those disciples so many thousands of years ago. Teaching them, discipling them, allowing them to feel and hear, feel his presence, but hear his words as he taught them. And this morning, Father, we repeat those that prayer that he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. morning. Today's scripture comes from Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 20 that are known as the Ten Commandments. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. 
they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. May God grant us understanding of his word. We thank you for the word that you give us. We ask that you instill inside me the, the um, ability to speak your word as you would have it, not as I would. And it's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Anybody notice what that is up there? Um, before I get into the picture uh, about this, but uh, let me uh, just share with you, Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, he defines love in, in 1 Corinthians. He says that love is patient, it is kind, it, it rejoices in the truth, it protects, it trusts, it, it, it hopes, and it also always perseveres. And so those are the positive aspects of love. But also Paul adds that love is not, he gives us several reasons that love is not. Love is not envious, it isn't boastful, it isn't proud, it isn't rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, and it doesn't delight in evil. However, that little thing does delight in evil. My feet are full of all kinds of evilness that that thing just started to, to um, give to me. This past week, um, an unexpected um, encounter happened for me. Um, it, it, this thing came into my life and it touched me very deeply. For years, I have been telling Kathy, I have been telling the boys, even though they've been begging for a long, young little kitten to come into our lives, or a cat just in general, for years I've been saying, listen, our cat, our current cat, Rascal, is the last cat that we will have in this house, until, of course, last Thursday. I was working at the post office, as I do pretty much Monday through Friday of every week, and an employee comes up to me and says, we have kittens, three of them exactly. My husband has them and we found them in a rental. They're, they're, they're going to have to go to a shelter. You know how those things are supposed to touch most people's heart. Well, my heart is very hard when it comes to that. But, and at this point, I, I somewhat kind of uh, you know, blew her off. I was unmoved by the whole thing. But then, you know what she did? She showed me a picture of the cat. Have you ever had that happen? It was love at first sight. I love the picture of, now that picture is not the picture of the, that she showed me. That's a picture of, of us feeding this poor little kitten some milk. Love is so simple, isn't it? It is so simple to love those little things in our lives, yet love is also very complex. For instance, when I think of a loving act, it's not attacking my feet with its little claws. That hurts. It's not climbing up the back of my legs all the way up to my neck. That hurts. Love is simple, but it's also very complex. For instance, it's not always, um, uh, it, love is not always perceived as, well, um, uh, um, a loving act to other people. Let me, let me give you an example. I love my wife so much that I would be willing, beyond a shadow of a doubt, to get up early in the morning and make her a cup of coffee. Anybody else feel the way about your spouse? I would love to be able to do that. However, the problem is, she does not like coffee. You, you see, what we think, what I think, what you think of as a loving act may not necessarily be perceived as a loving act by someone else. Love is so simple, yet it is still very complex, isn't it? Love can also be hard. It's not just complex, but it's also hard. It's hard to live out. Especially when uh, the other person is, well, maybe you have somebody in your mind, uh, not so loving. You ever had one of those individuals inside your family, you want to love them, but they're not very uh, uh, susceptible to, to that love that you want to give them. They don't love back. 
Love is, is hard. It's difficult when, when you're encountering somebody that's always angry, no matter what the scenario. They could be given a house and they'd be angry about, about the house. Uh, love is hard when the, the individual is manipulative in the life. Lo, love is hard when, it's, uh, when you see vindictive people. Love is hard when you see uh, addictive behaviors in them. Love is hard when, when they are overbearing in their relationship with you. Love can be hard. Love is simple. It is complex. It's also hard. Love is also hard to understand. For instance, I dearly love my wife. I dearly love my boys. I dearly love my, my, my new cat. But I also love football. You see? I love a great hamburger. But we can't equate that on the same level, can we? We can't. It's just not possible. Yes, love is simple. It is complex. And it is hard. And as we think about all of this, when someone says, I love the Lord my God, can you begin to see, begin to understand that the nature of love starts to create confusion in our lives? The nature of love is simple, it is very complex, and it's sometimes very difficult. Moses is going to repeat the words in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that God gives him, and so the Lord God gives him these words. He said, oh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and these words which I commanding you today shall be on your heart. Love guides our relationship with God and with everyone around us. But love is a two-way street. God loved his family so much that he brought them out of Egypt and he brings them out of slavery to the base of this mountain in the wilderness so that he could give them what we know is these 10 foundational commandments, the 10 commandments. And it was given to guide their love for God and for one another. And he begins... In these first two verses, it says, And God spoke these words. God speaks is the title of the sermon. God speaks all of these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And so here's this God. He loves his family so much that he conveyed to them who he really is and still, I mean, sorry, who he was and who he still is today. I am the Lord, your God. Yahweh is a, a translation that you've heard. I like that, that we picked the first song, the great Jehovah. The Lord, your God, which reveals a very neat aspect of his nature. And if you like to understand that nature, you have to look up the word Lord and God. Lord being something that I don't think we can really relate to today. Uh, but a, a governor over your life, a lord over your life. And so Israel would have understood that because they had Egypt lording themselves over their lives. And so they understood what that meant to have a lord over their lives. And so he reveals this aspect of his nature to Israel. And then he has summarized the entire Exodus, everything that they'd been on up to this point, in one very small sentence. Now, if we had studied that entire Exodus, we would have taken nine chapters to do the whole thing. The Exodus was no simple task. It was no small task. There was a lot to it. And all he says, all that the Lord says to them, I brought you out of Egypt, the land of slavery. As if to say to Israel, remember, remember what I have done for you. But, but don't stop there. I I want you to remember it, but I also want you to appreciate what I have done for you. Church, do you remember, do you appreciate what the Lord has done for you? That's what 
That's why we're here. That's one of the reasons. We're trying to remember what God has done for us. We're trying to remember what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we're, 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 He is wanting us to appreciate that. Appreciate what He has done. Remember and appreciate what He has done. Maybe, maybe you can't remember it because you haven't experienced that yet. Maybe you can't appreciate it because you haven't experienced the love that Christ has given to each and every one of us. God was saying that, the Lord God was saying that to Israel, remember what I have done for you. I have brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the land of slavery. Then the Lord God provided them with these rules, these laws, these commandments, which became the primary hub that would govern Israel's religious and their civil laws so that they could walk this journey to the end, to the promised land. The, four, uh, the first of the four commandments, they all pertain to um, their relationship, our relationship with God. So it's an up and down relationship. Think of the cross, our relationship with God. And the last six commandments pertain to our relationship in the community amongst each other of God, the cross member. It's ironic that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross when you think about this. Two of the commandments uh, are positive, thou shalt or you shall, depending on the translation you have. The, the last eight are negative, thou shalt not or you shall not. That's not going to happen. And he says in the first commandment, he says, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. You know, it's interesting to read that and think, you know, this is the pinnacle of all the Ten Commandments. It's the first one he gives us. And, you know, if people today, if the church today actually followed this very one commandment, there would be no need for any of the rest of the Ten Commandments. We would have no need for them. If God was our God and we had no other gods before him, everything else would simply fall in place. However, God, in his knowledge of that we can't follow that. By nature, we just simply follow from that. Israel was quite good at it. You could walk through the entire history of Israel and see how they fell away from that first commandment. They disobeyed it constantly. And if we're honest with ourselves, we are too. We have placed other gods before him. I often think of things like money or, or homes, or, you know, so I want a, more money, I want a bigger home, I want a better car, I want a better cell phone, I want a, a, a better dot, 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 et cetera. You could go on, you can name your own things. But at the core of this, placing a God before God, the Lord our God, is really me. I want to place myself, my needs, my wants before God. Yet, when God speaks to us, when the Lord God speaks to us in love, he says, listen, I am the Lord your God. There is no other, so love me above all else. That's really difficult for us to do. That's the first commandment. The second commandment, he says, is you shall not make for yourself, this is the negative one, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above on earth or beneath or in the waters below. Hmm. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commands. So God, he's meeting with Moses. He's meeting with him on Mount Sinai. He's there with Joshua. And, and Israel is down at the base of the mountain, not with Joshua, not with Moses. And they're disobeying not only the first commandment, placing another God before God, they were also disobeying the second commandment. They were already making an idol in the form of a cow. Or actually a bull, I think, is what it was. They were actively building the idol, and God knew it. 
Worshiping anything other than God himself, images, icons, politicians, institutions, all of it, I don't care how far you go with those uh, examples, they all dishonor God and they mislead other people. And so who is it or what is it that we worship or are prone to worship? You know, uh, this has been a, 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 an interesting battle in churches for generation after generation, but the older generation might say to the younger generation, listen, you worship or you idolize technology. Have you ever heard that? You pull out a cell phone and you think, why do they have to have a cell phone in, in church? You know what I idolize? I idolize coffee. Sometimes I've drank too much of it. And, and so there's this huge conversation in some churches about whether coffee should be allowed in the sanctuary or not. So, so the older generation may say to the younger, you, you, you idolize coffee, you idolize uh, um, technology. The, the younger generation may look at the older generation and say, but, but you idolize, well, tradition. We have to do things this way. All of it, in some way, shape, or form, is an idol. However, if we're honest with ourselves, we begin to realize that the focus is on what I am comfortable with, what, what I like. And it all changes depend on the individual. Yet when God speaks to a people, He speaks to us in love, and He says, listen, I am the Lord your God. There is no other. So, so, so lay it all down. Worship me above all else. Don't worship anything else. Just worship me. So those are the first two commandments. The third one, he says this. It's in verse 7. He says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. I don't know if anybody else has it in their house, but we have um, one in the house. It's a cross, and it has all of the names of the God. It's a wall decoration. It's really uh, intriguing. I have a chair that sits kind of across the room, and I look at it just about every single day. And God's various names are, are plastered all over it. Uh, Creator, Father, Lord, all, Almighty, Everlasting, a Master, Holy One, Most High, Savior, Redeemer. You probably have something like that somewhere in your house. And, and, and the idea is us for us to focus on the aspects, the nature, the character of God in the cross. And for us to take God's name in vain is to misuse God's very nature, His very essence. And, and, and if you have used God's name to achieve something that, that will serve you the best for your own purposes, or, or maybe you've used God's name to imply something like, well, God told me to do it, or, or a membership vow, or a marital vow, whatever it might be, you have used God's name. Now the question is, have you ever misused God's name in one of those ways? So let's ask the question, and I'm just giving you some examples. How have you misused God's name? God's saying to Israel, listen, when I speak, I speak to you in love. I am the Lord your God. There is no other. So please honor my name above all others. And then he goes on to give us the fourth commandment in verses 8 through 11. He says, and this is really difficult for me. Maybe it is for you as well. But he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or, or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and he made it holy. This past week, uh, um, I joined a group of men uh, in a Bible study. It's called Bible Study Fellowship. And uh, we're studying in creation, um, Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, the whole 
uh, beginning of creation, and we're going to go through the entire book of Genesis. Uh, but as uh, we were discussing this past week with our small group of men, we began to ponder what it meant for God to rest on the seventh day. And, and it's interesting to note all of the different opinions on this. Uh, one person acknowledged that the seventh day was a day dedicated to the Lord. Now, how that played out, you know, in his life, I'm not quite sure, but but he he indicated that like uh, for instance the Sunday should be the the um, the Sabbath it should be the Sabbath for each and every one of us. Another indicated that that this day this seventh day was was a, a day that wasn't to be slothful. We were supposed to actually be actively doing something that's set apart for the Lord in spiritual service to Him. However, that played out was different depending on the individual. He explained. Then another individual said, well, well, listen, it's on this day that, that, that we are to reflect or we're to think about our relationship with God and how that interacted in the last six days that you've been working. I liked all of those examples. And then the last gentleman, he, he, he actually brought up something I'd never even pondered before, but he said, he said, listen, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ's completed work on the cross. And that began to open some thoughts within me. Now, all of these are great ideas. All of these are plausible examples to me. And I just want us to keep in mind this. The central point is to set apart a day to the Lord, however that looks, so that you can build an amazing relationship with Him and in whatever way. Maybe it is in spiritual service. Maybe it is in reflection. Maybe it is because Jesus Christ died on the cross. However that is, set it aside. When God was speaking to Israel, Christ had not died on the cross, but He was speaking to them in love. And He was saying, I am the Lord your God. There's no other. So, keep the Sabbath, set it apart, keep it holy to me. And then he gives them the, the fifth commandment. It's, a, it's kind of a, a commandment that actually links the top four with the bottom five. And it says this, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. Here's this link between the upper half of the cross, our relationship with God, and the bottom half, the relationship amongst the church, amongst God's family. You see, with the last five commandments, all of that exists because we love the Lord our God, who gave us the first four commandments. And all of that is linked with a promise to enter the promised land. That's what I'm going to provide with you. But if you can't honor your mother and fa father and mother, how in the world can you expect to honor me? The fifth commandment uh, always, uh, it's, it's a way of laying the foundation for establishing this holy relationship with the family that's already been established by your holy relationship with God. And so, so now we are to honor our parents, and that doesn't mean that we have to always agree with your parents. Did you hear that, Mom? just want you to know. However, we are to honor our parents. Rather, the fifth commandment is there, it's established to protect the sanctity of the home. By the way, I'm going to get in trouble by my mom with that comment. When we fail to honor our parents, what are we doing? We're teaching our children. We're teaching our friends. We're teaching the world that it's okay to dishonor their parents. It's okay to dishonor God in heaven. By the way, if you've ever asked the question, what's going on in the world today? I think that this is the core of the problem. Not only can we not honor God, we can't honor our parents. Thus, we have conflict that exists within the world today. We're teaching others to dishonor those who are around us if we can't obey this commandment. Yet when God is speaking to Israel, He says, listen, I'm speaking to you in love. 
And I'm saying, listen, I am the Lord your God. There's no other. So please, if you want to have a a great relationship, if you want to sanctify your home, uh, honor your father and honor your mother so that you can also honor me. And then he says in the, uh, the sixth command, he says this, you shall not murder. Very simple. Yet murder doesn't begin with murder. If you were to to walk into Matthew chapter 5, you could actually unroot some of this. But murder is rooted in self-satisfaction. It it begins with anger, and it moves to unforgiveness, and it moves to to murder of the heart, and sometimes even murder in an actual physical form. But murdering someone else destroys God's image. Never fail to forget that. Think about that when God created Adam in the Garden of Eden. He created him in love. And when we begin to murder someone, whether it's emotionally or physically, we are murdering God himself. And when God was speaking to Israel, he said, listen, I am the Lord your God. There is no other. So please do not murder those whom I love one of the reasons that some of the churches actually take a stance that we will not enter war because that simply is an affront to God's image. And then the seventh commandment, he says this, he says, listen, you should not commit adultery. Again, you could walk into Matthew chapter 5 and read a lot about this, but this commandment also is there to protect the sanctity of the home. Adultery is a breach of trust whether it's your spouse or someone else, but truly it's unfaithfulness. And you can do it to your spouse, you can do it to a friend, you can do it to the Lord your God. You can become unfaithful. Yet adultery does not begin with adultery. Rather, adultery is rooted in self-satisfaction. The marital vow itself is a holy commitment, and that is rooted in God's love, and it's true, and it's sacrificial. And when we breach that trust, when we breach that in any way, shape, or form, we are breaching our relationship with God. And when God was speaking to Israel, he says to them in love, he says, I am the Lord your God, there is no other, so please do not breach your trust, not, not just with me, but also don't breach it with your family. Honor that one another. Don't commit adultery. And the last one, the next one, the eighth one, is don't steal. This reveals a very basic nature within culture to to, to respect another's property. And it's not just about stealing a wallet. It's not just about taking someone's radio or their car. Think about this in a broader sense. Have you ever walked away with a pen that wasn't yours because you liked it? Have you ever gotten angry at an employer that, that pressured to you to work the off the clock? Have you ever been uh, to a company that overcharged simply because they know they can get away with it? Have you ever borrowed money never intending to repay it? Have you ever cheated on your taxes or found loopholes in your taxes? The church has a, a very bad habit of this sometimes by, uh, by stealing from God when we begin to place our concerns above uh, his concerns and the concerns of others. What serves me the best rather than serves God the best? You see, stealing is also rooted in self-satisfaction. What makes me happy? What pleases me? And when God was speaking to Israel in love, he was saying, listen, I am the Lord your God. There is no other. Don't steal. Don't steal from me. Don't steal from your family. Don't steal from the word because it damages our reputation, my reputation in the world. And the ninth commandment that he gives them is this He says, Listen, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. No slandering, no gossip, no exaggeration. No distortions, no lying. Please don't be dishonest because dishonesty is rooted also in self satisfaction. Truthful heart is rooted in God's truth, and protecting that truth is fundamental to maintaining a stable relationship with God and within the family. 
And when God speaks to us in love, he says, listen, I am the Lord your God. There is no other, so don't lie. Don't lie to the world. Don't lie to your family. Don't lie to me. And the final commandment, he says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or, or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. You know, this kind of caps off the Ten Commandments. It brings us right back to our love of, of others, our love of God and of others. Our, but our culture seems to be um, taking us in a completely different direction. It's, in, it's immersed in coveting. There are deep lusts for a wide variety of different products all over. You can see it on TV. You can see it on your phones. You can see it everywhere. And materialism drives that. And materialism also drives dissatisfaction uh, with what we have or what we do not have or what we can't get. And, and, and covetous relationships, covetous within our heart, it leads to a great many sins. Uh, coveting another spouse, as, as the Lord tells them. Um, it, it's rooted in, in stealing. It's rooted really in self-satisfaction, what pleases me. And so once again, we see the self entering into this. And so, so as we get back to the end of it, uh, as we think about the first of the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yet uh, this at the end says, this is my will. I want to be God. Yet when God is speaking to them, he's saying to Israel, I I'm speaking to you in love. I am the Lord your God. There is no other, so don't covet covet the world, don't covet uh, the family, don't covet uh, anything other than me. I am the Lord God. Jesus would repeat these commandments. He would say, listen, the law, the Ten Commandments, and the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. The greatest is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The love of God is the root of every single relationship. And without God, there is no love. Yet with God, there is love in Christ. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And truthfully, that is why Jesus Christ went to the cross. That is how Jesus Christ decided to go to the cross. And he responded in love for and for the people. He was in love with God, and he was in love for God, and he sacrificed his life on the cross for us. So when God speaks, spoke to Israel, when he speaks to us in love, he says, listen, I am the Lord your God. There's no other. Love me with all of your heart. Love me with all of your soul. Love me with all of your strength. Love me with all of your mind so that you are able to love your neighbor as yourself. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the lesson that you give us and the challenge that you give us. We ask that you allow us to take these into the world and love, love you first so that we can love our family and our neighbors. And it's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Won't you please stand?
Go now, loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.